Professor Chomsky, what is the fate of an honest intellectual? There's a history, goes back uh, 2,500 years, uh, back to the origins of recorded history, uh, classical Greece, uh, the biblical records. Uh, so go back to Greece. Uh, there was a man who was accused of corrupting the youth of Athens by asking searching questions. Uh, his fate was to be killed with poison, given the hemlock. Uh, in the biblical record, which is partly accurate, partly not, uh, there were critical intellectuals. Uh, the word that's used for them is prophets. That's a dubious translation of an obscure Hebrew phrase. Uh, what it actually what they were, if you look at what they were saying, were those critics. They criticized the acts of the evil kings. They gave geopolitical analysis, warned that the policies were going to lead to disaster. They called for uh, help to widows and orphans and so on. And that's what today we call dissident intellectuals. And what happened to them? They were imprisoned, uh, driven into the desert, uh, maligned, uh, the worst of the kings, uh, King Ahab, uh, condemned the uh, prophet Elijah as a hater of Israel because he was condemning the acts of the evil kings, probably the origin of the notion of uh, anti-American, anti-Israel, and so on. And it goes the same way throughout history. So going up to modern times, the, uh, the term intellectual in the current sense is, was really not used before the late 19th century came into use at the time of the uh, Dreyfus trial in France. And the Dreyfus arts, Emil Zola and others who uh, supported Dreyfus, condemned the state and the military. Uh, they were critical intellectuals. They were bitterly condemned by the mainstream of the intellectual classes. Uh, uh, Zola himself had to flee France for, for his life. Uh, that's the treatment of dissidents. Shortly after that came the First World War was very striking. A lot of commentary on it now. It's the centenary, so huge discussion. But one of the most interesting things is the reaction of intellectuals. On every side, the intellectual classes lined up passionately in support of their own state. In Germany, uh, there was a manifesto of 93 leading intellectuals uh, instructing the civilized world that uh, Germany was defending the great cultural legacy of uh, Goethe, Beethoven, uh, Kant, and so on, and the world should join them. On the Western side, the same. There were critics. There were Bertrand Russell uh, in England, uh, Rosa Luxemburg, uh, Karl Liebknecht in Germany, uh, Eugene Debs in the United States. They were in jail. Uh, that's intellectuals. What is the price that you have personally paid as an intellectual for uh, criticizing the uh, actions of your own community? Uh, the United States is a pretty free society these days. And uh, people with a degree of privilege uh, are not subject to, you know, it's not like Turkey today where you're thrown in jail if you say something the president doesn't like. Uh, so it's vilification marginalization, denunciation. Uh, actually, there, there were penalties, but they were self-induced. I uh, was involved extensively in civil disobedience and resistance and came pretty close to a long jail sentence, but I can't call that repression. It was things I was doing consciously. Under the liberal administrations of the 1960s, the club of academic intellectuals designed and implemented the Vietnam War and uh, uh, other uh, similar, though smaller, actions. This particular community is a very relevant one to consider at a place like MIT because, of course, you're all free to enter, enter this community. In fact, you're invited and encouraged to enter uh, the community of technical intelligentsia and weapons designers and counterinsurgency uh, experts and pragmatic planners of an American empire. First, a handful of advisors, then the Marines. Finally, an army of half a million. 
That was the Vietnam War. It was an undeclared war, a war without front lines or clear objectives. Uh, the United States invaded South Vietnam, attacked South Vietnam, in certainly no later than 1962. That's when John F. Kennedy sent the U.S. Air Force to start bombing South Vietnamese villages, uh, authorized the use of napalm, uh, sent American forces into combat situations, and so on. That's an invasion, okay? Then the invasion built up into a huge attack on all of Indochina. All right, that's now, what, 31 years? Uh, I've, I'm waiting to find some phrase, one phrase in the American press, one. No, I'm not asking for a lot. One phrase in the whole mainstream press that refers to such an event as the U.S. invasion of South Vietnam. I can't find it. Uh, what you find is, uniformly, the American defense of South Vietnam, maybe unwise, against terrorists supported from the outside. Word by word paraphrase of uh, what the Agitprop Bureau told them. I know people like uh, Norman Finkelstein, he, uh, he uh, faced certain consequences. You know, he wasn't able to get tenure in his university. And it was a special case. Very special. It was a rotten case, but a special one. Uh, Norman Finkelstein exposed the uh, dishonesty and criminality uh, uh, of a Harvard Law professor, uh, Alan Dershowitz, who went berserk and tried in any way he could think of to destroy Finkelstein, uh, to the point I go through the details, but it was Dershowitz's jihad to try to protect himself. From, he knew that he could not answer Finkelstein's criticisms, so the way he picked was to try to uh, vilification, denunciation, uh, massive efforts to prevent him from getting tenure, which he was, and uh, yes, but, so that happened, and it's a rotten case, but it is a special case. I have no intention whatsoever of getting involved in an ad hominem uh, debate with Mr. Dershowitz. Dershowitz. I'm interested in the facts. I was asked to come in and discuss his new book. I went home, I purchased one copy, in fact, I purchased two copies. I read the book very carefully. I did what, what someone serious does with a book. I read the text. I went through the footnotes. I went through it very carefully. And there's only one conclusion one can reach, having read the book. And this is a scholarly judgment. It's not an ad hominem attack. Mr. Dershowitz has concocted a fraud. In fact, Mr. Dershowitz has concocted a fraud which, amazingly, in large parts, he plagiarized from another f fraud. Now, I found that pretty shocking. I found it shocking coming from a Harvard professor. I find it shocking coming from any professor. Pre-modern society. Well, Pre-modern means uh, not having assimilated and accepted the basic values of the Enlightenment and since. And that's a large part of the Western world. Take the United States, uh, leader of the free world, uh, most powerful state in human history, uh, supposedly a beacon of freedom and enlightenment. Uh, takes a global warming, one of the, maybe the major problem that humans have ever faced. Uh, it's hard to convince people in the United States that it's a real problem reason. 40% of the population thinks it can't be a problem, 40%, because Jesus is coming in a few decades. Is that pre-modern? Yeah, it's pre-modern. It's a culturally conservative society, uh, pre-modern in many of its ways, the respects. Uh, take Europe. It takes, say, Austria and Germany, two countries which evoke some memories from the 1930s. In Austria, the neo-Nazi party is uh, likely to take the presidency. In Germany, an uh, ultra-right nationalist party with neo-fascist tendencies is uh, winning, is uh, defeating the mainstream uh, Merkel party in local elections. Is that pre-modern? Was Nazism pre-modern? Depends what you mean by modern. If you mean by that, not having assimilated the fundamental uh, values that were uh, 
brought forth during the Enlightenment and since you know, much of the world is pre-modern. In fact, take a phenomenon that's, um, that's taking place right at this moment. There's a conference in Morocco, as you know, the COP22 conference. It's an effort, an international effort, to put some teeth in the global warming agreements. What's happening at COP22 is that the values and hopes of civilization are being upheld by China, by China, a harsh authoritarian state is in the lead in trying to mobilize support to deal with this massive problem. The United States, the leader of the free world, is at the end of the line trying to draw the train backwards. It's an astonishing phenomenon. And it's not commented on. Until not so long ago, liberal, socialist, and Marxist theoreticians assumed that conflicts involving ethnicity were a phenomenon of pre-modern society and that such conflicts would progressively fade away. Why haven't we as a society been able to overcome the futility of engaging in ethnic conflicts, the uselessness? Why haven't we been able to overcome that? To some extent we have. Uh, not totally. I mean, there has been progress. Now, take, say, Europe. Now, for centuries, Europe was the most savage place in the world. The Europeans were just slurring one another. In the Thirty Years' War of the 17th century, uh, maybe a third of the population of Germany was wiped out. Now, there was another Thirty Years' War in the 20th century, from 1914 to 1945. Total horror story. I uh, don't have to tell you what happened in Europe, the rest of the world. Now, since 1945, there haven't been any major wars in Europe. Is that because we're more civilized? No. It's because it was understood that the next time you have a war, you're finished. Humans have created the capacity to destroy themselves and everything else. And we've come very close to blowing everything up. There have been many, many cases where a terminal nuclear war was extremely close, and the threat is in fact increasing now. I haven't crossed the border, but it's close. It's official. Israel is a state exclusively for Jews. That's the essence of the controversial nation-state bill passed by the Knesset on Thursday. After hours of heated debate, the measure became law by a vote of 62 to 55, with two abstentions. For years, the language of the bill divided political opinion between the ruling parties and the opposition. Arab members of the Knesset say the law legalizes discrimination. This is a bill from a government that is an enemy to Palestinians. It's the most dangerous measure. It's a law from a racist government against Palestinian rights, and it creates an apartheid regime it turns Israel into a fascist state. Why is it dangerous to recognize a country as a Muslim state or a Buddhist state or a Jewish state or a Christian state? Why, why is that uh, dangerous? Why shouldn't For people, it depends what your values are. If you believe in democracy, states are states of their citizens, not of some privileged sector of the citizens. So if the United States were called a white state that would be outrageous. Similarly, if we're called a Christian state. Now, similarly, if Pakistan is an Islamic state. That's saying, or if Israel is called a Jewish state. That's saying that our society recognizes two categories of citizens, a privileged category and the others. And that violates the most elementary principles of the democratic uh, freedom. With, um, if, I should say, if these designations are, are just symbolic, maybe it doesn't matter. So, for example, in the United States, if the official day of rest is Sunday instead of Thursday, okay, it's not, not a big deal. It's symbolic, so okay. With um, rebel conflicts and separatist conflicts uh, being waged in various parts of the globe, uh, do you believe, um, what role can federalism play in destabilizing these conflicts? Federalism? Yeah. Well, I'm going to take, say, Europe again. 
one of the great achievements of uh, post-war Europe, now under threat, incidentally, is a slow move towards a kind of federalism. So the Schengen Agreement, which permits free passage among the countries of Europe, uh, is a step towards more tolerant, civilized society. It's a kind of federalism. Uh, it has uh, positive and negative aspects because of the ways it's implemented. Because of the way it was integrated into the Eurozone, which is something separate from the EU, it has led to a situation where sovereignty has passed from populations to the bureaucracy in Brussels uh, with the German banks hanging over their shoulders. That's where the basic decisions are made. Uh, doesn't matter who people elect for, uh, you know, for, for, for their own governments, uh, the, the major decisions are going to be out of their hands. That's led to extreme resentment, uh, justified resentment. It's taking uh, self-destructive paths, but the resentment is understandable. That's part of the ba background for the right, for the rise of these uh, ultra-right parties, which appeal to the population on the grounds that they no longer control their own destiny. Uh, if Le Pen wins in France, as she might, uh, she might very well uh, implement uh, what they call Brexit, you know, a referendum to pull France out of the European Union, which would destroy it. Now we're back to Europe of competing nationalities, which pretty ugly past. How has the concept of genocide uh, become, as you state, uh, politically vulgarized? And why is it wrong to, why is it dangerous to politicize the concept of genocide? Well, genocide had a meaning in the early stages. I mean, it's not a matter of the definition, but the way it was understood. Uh, genocide meant uh, what the Nazis did to the Jews, for example. Now, that was genocide. By now, the term is used uh, so broadly that uh, uh, people even talk about committing genocide against uh, 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 five people, you know, or a, a massacre somewhere with a couple hundred people is called genocide. And in fact, it's used in a very restricted way. So we use the term genocide to refer to atrocities committed by someone else, not our own. So it's not genocide. Let's take a real case. Now let's take Clinton's sanction, Clinton and Blair sanctions on Iraq. That actually was called genocide by the uh, distinguished uh, international diplomats who administered the uh, oil for food program, the so-called humanitarian aspect of the sanctions. Uh, Dennis Halliday, then, who resigned in protest because he said they're genocidal. Uh, Hans von Sponek, who followed him, resigned in protest on the grounds that these are amount to genocide. Uh, von Sponek, in fact, published a detailed book about it called Another Kind of War. Uh, they did condemn the sanctions as genocidal. But what was the result? Try to find a copy of von Sponek's book. Try to find a reference to it. Try to find a review. Uh, try to find anything. Uh, this is wiped out of Western commentary. Uh, last time I looked, there was not a single review in the United States. And the only review in England, I think, was in the Communist Party newspaper. The names, uh, genocide in particular, uh, come into being against a background of the 20th century and mass slaughter of the 20th century, and particularly the Holocaust. And against that background, uh, Lemkin uh, <clears throat> convinced that the international community, and particularly states in the international community, have an obligation to intervene when there is genocide. Uh, he is successful in getting the international community to adopt a resolution on this. Then follows the politics around genocide. And the politics around genocide is 
uh, when is the slaughter of civilians a genocide or not? Which particular slaughter is going to be named genocide and which one is not going to be named genocide? So if you look at the last 10 years and take some examples of mass slaughter, for example, the mass slaughter in Iraq, which is in terms of numbers at least uh, no less than what is going on in Sudan, or the mass slaughter in Congo, which in terms of numbers is probably 10 times what happened, what has been happening in Darfur. But none of these have been named as genocide. Only the slaughter in Darfur has been named as genocide. So there is obviously a politics around this naming, and that's the politics that I was interested in. And what do you think? What do you think this politics is? Well, I think that what's happening is that genocide is being instrumentalized by the biggest power on the earth today, which is the United States. It is being instrumentalized in a way that mass slaughters which implicate its adversaries are being named as genocide, and those which implicate its friends or its proxies are not being named as genocide. And that is not what Lemkin had in mind. So what needs to be done to reverse the political vulgarization of the concept of genocide? Can it be still used in... It can be used if we are willing to become civilized, uh, to recognize that crimes are crimes, whether they commit them or we commit them. That we could, for example, listen to uh, Justice Robert Jackson's uh, injunction to the... He was the chief prosecutor at Nuremberg. He spoke to the tribunal and said, We're, we have to recognize that crimes are crimes, whether they commit them or we commit them. We are handing these defendants, he said, a poisoned chalice. And if we sip from it, we must be subject to the same conditions. If not, the whole trial is a farce. Uh, is that applied? I mean, when Britain and the United States invaded Iraq, it's a textbook example of aggression with absolutely no justification. Textbook example of what the Nuremberg Tribunal called the supreme international crime, which differs from other war, war crimes in that it in, includes uh, all of the evil that follows. For example, the rise of ISIS and the death of millions of people that includes all of that. It does, can you find any commentary in the United States even calling this a crime? Uh, Obama is uh, uh, greatly admired on the left because he said it was a blunder. Uh, just like German generals after Stalingrad who said the two-front war was a blunder, which it was should have knocked out England first. But that's as far as you can go. The head of Human Rights Watch, Kenneth Roth, when this is specifically brought to his attention, can only go as far as saying it was a mistake. Uh, was it a mistake uh, when the Nazis committed aggression? When the Russians invaded uh, Afghanistan, was that a mistake? Well, you know, if you were a loyal communist, it was a mistake. We don't call it that. But we cannot rise to the level of civilization. Even the head of Human Rights Watch in the leading left liberal journal of intellectuals in the West, New York Review, uh, Obama, anybody, can't say that we committed a crime. Can't say that. At most we make mistakes. Go back to Justice Jackson. Anybody listen to his words? That take Vietnam the worst crime of the post-Second World War, post-war era, worst crime. Millions of people killed, four countries, three countries destroyed, uh, horrible uh, people still dying from the chemical warfare that was initiated by John F. Kennedy and expanded. Uh, is it a mistake? Is it a crime? Is anybody guilty, responsible? Right now, the Obama administration is uh, sponsoring uh, Mem a big memorial of the Vietnam War. And Obama made a you know, passionate speech with his elevated rhetoric about uh, the, the, what, the, what happened. He even did talk about crimes, talked about the crimes that were committed against American veterans. 
who were not treated properly. Uh, what about the Vietnamese? Let's take uh, Jimmy Carter, human rights president. Right after the war, hadn't been forgotten, 1977, he was asked uh, in a press conference, uh, do we owe any debt to Vietnam? He said, we owe them no debt because the destruction was mutual. 1977, human rights president. Was there a comment? A few. I commented on it, a couple of other people, but uh, that just passes. Until we rise to a minimal level of civilization, we can't use the term genocide. Individuals like John Mearsheimer, Ken, uh, Kenneth Waltz, Joseph Nye have all defined what they consider to be power in international relations. You've criticized power structures and power systems, um, but I would like to know what do you consider to be power in the field of international relations? It's pretty straightforward. Power is the ability to uh, uh, issue orders which others have to follow. And to the extent that you can do that, you have power. The orders don't have to be verbal, they can be actions. So uh, if you can invade Iraq, worst crime of the uh, 21st century, and you get no censure for it, or no reaction, that's power. In the um, aftermath of conflicts, to what extent are uh, truth and reconciliation commissions a viable form of achieving justice and accountability? Um, I think they make sense in many situations. So for example, uh, take say South Africa. Uh, there were horrible crimes committed under apartheid. But to try to punish people for those crimes would have torn the society to shreds, uh, undermined any hope of progress and development. So a decision was made by the ANC, uh, which I I think is understandable to uh, avoid direct punishment and to settle for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to expose the nature of what happened, so at least it's kind of understood. Same was done in uh, Central America, same in Brazil, the same in East Timor. Take East Timor, which was, uh, if the term genocide has any meaning, uh, what Indonesia did in East Timor with the backing of the United States, Britain, other Western countries, even Sweden, uh, that comes about as close to genocide as anything since the Second World War. Okay, East Timor finally, amazingly, won its independence. Uh, should they car as, should they try to carry out war crimes trials against Indonesia, Australia, the United States, and others, or should they? try to mend the fences with Indonesia and maybe settle for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I think the latter, which is in fact what they're doing, they have to live in the world, right? Now let's take where we happen to be sitting right now. Uh, the uh, native population uh, suffered an, a migrant crisis of an incredible kind, not the kind that we talked about, the migrant crisis where the immigrants come in with the intention of exterminating and expelling the population. Now that, that's not what we call a crisis. But that's what happened here. There are remnants of the people who used to live here. They have a reservation in Cape Cod and Mashpee. Should they institute war crimes trials against uh, the people who live in their homes? Wouldn't make a lot of sense. It would make a lot of sense to uh, bring out understanding of what happened, to call for reparations and so on, but not war crimes struggles. It just means nothing in, in these circumstances. Is it genocide? I mean, the population of uh, this territory of the United States at the time the colonists arrived was, nobody knows for sure, maybe 10 million, something like that. By 1900, it was, when there was a census, it was about 200,000. Uh, this continent, the Western Hemisphere, had maybe 
80 million people when uh, Columbus arrived. And pretty soon about 90% of them were gone. I think as an anarchist in the long term, you believe that centralized political power ought to be eliminated and turned down to the local level. So what role, if any, would federalism play in your long-term vision of anarchism? Well, the general anarchist pictures, at least within the tradition I associate myself with, were highly federalist, but they assumed uh, they were based on the notion of voluntary association. So there should be uh, self-determination uh, in all institutionals, institutions and structures of life, but uh, voluntary associations could extend to uh, regions, uh, countries, internationally, uh, and that's a kind of federalism supported from below. That's Makes good sense in a complex world, I think.